Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and today I have my good friend, Nate Gardner, here co-hosting the show with me. Nate, welcome to the show. Can you give a quick introduction about yourself for our listeners so that they know what experience you have and uh, you know how, how you know me? <laughs> you bet. Thanks for having me, Andy. Appreciate it. Yeah, so I've been in IT for 24 years. I've been in information security specifically for around 10 years. I'm currently an information security manager, operations manager. Um, met you at um, my current job at Exact Sciences, where you were a um, cyber analyst along with myself at that time. And yeah, looking forward to diving in and see what we can do. So I found this article that came across my feed, all my RSS feeds with these different security articles. And I thought it was a really interesting article and struck home for me because as a prior military veteran and law enforcement officer, I was always kind of geared towards being more rigid and kind of saying no to things, right? Like I knew something was unsafe, so I'm going to say no to this. And when I worked with you and then Doug Turchek, who we had on the show a few, almost a few months ago now, I learned a great deal from both of you guys in a real world environment and how to become successful. And this article is basically about mistakes that security teams can make that would impact their success. So I, thought this would be a great conversation to have with you, Nate, because you are a very easygoing person in both <laughs> life and as a coworker and in the information security space. So let's dive in and take a look at what this article says. So the article essentially talks about how, not necessarily from technical skills, because oftentimes we focus on all the different technical skills and products and everything that we can implement in the security space to make companies more secure. But the attitude that you bring to that, essentially how you approach the business can really impact your success in whether you want to deploy a certain policy or you want to deploy a certain tool. And the first point that they had in the article was lack of gratitude. And when I read this, I took it kind of both ways. One from lack of gratitude sometimes from leaders in the information security space because we have a very tough job in trying to secure a company. It's very thankless. And so sometimes as a leader, it's really good to try to boost the morale of your team to provide that gratitude. But also in the sense of if someone does a good job outside of your security team, someone reports something or they report a phishing email or they report a vulnerability or someone reports, hey, I see that there's a service account that's a local admin on the server. You know, those sorts of things, you, they bring them up to the security team. It's really good to show that gratitude. And if you don't, then those people may cease to, you know, report things to you. So that's how I took it. And I think that's a really good tip is both from leadership to show that gratitude to your subordinates in the information security team as well as providing that gratitude to the business when they are trying to help you out. Oh, a hundred percent. A lot of it's all about, you know, it's about building relationships. Whether those relationships are with, you know, your direct reports, colleagues, end user base, you know, if you don't, if you don't build that relationship, you're, you're not going to be very successful with any sort of security awareness program or implementing security tools or processes, policies, et cetera. Um, you know, if you, if you don't reward your end users with, you know, it, it can be something as simple as, hey, when they click, let's say it's a, it's a phishing simulation type scenario, and they click on the, the simulated phishing message and it says, congratulations, thank you, you've done, you know, you've done well. That's huge, that's great, right? At least it's something. 
Um, many security awareness programs do. They include a you know full-on award program where you know the top five clickers or you know reporters for the month receive something. That's that's a good thing to do. But then also with within IT itself, if a sysadmin comes over and says, "Hey, you know, I noticed this." Well, that's great. You know, definitely reach out, make sure their you know manager knows, and you know thank him. And if there's an internal reward system, definitely use that to help out. Um, it's it, it's just building that relationship again, and and that'll that'll go a long way when you go to implement maybe another tool or a process or policy. They you know they're going to take you with a little more sincerity, and it won't have the level of um, maybe block that might normally be in place where people are like no, not another you know not not something else you're going to have you know, more friction for the end user. I like how you put that as far as relationships, because I remember when I was working for another company, I started at the help desk and at the help desk, you're helping people fix things. And so you do establish that relationship. Mm -hmm. They know, you know, Andy's going to fix this for me. I'm going to go to him. He's my go-to guy. And then I moved to security and I used that essentially relationship collateral, right? As... Mm -hmm. If I needed a tester for something, as I started deploying security tools, I could use that relationship be, be like, hey, I need you to test this for me. I will make sure that you're taken care of. And they know that because I built the relationship. When I worked with you, that was a little bit different. I, I found that coming in as security was very different with no relationships to people and starting from scratch. So, you know, I think that's a really good way to think about things, especially when you're brand new at a company yes. and mm -hmm. you you have zero relationships with anyone there like that that should be your main focus first before you start diving into the tools and that was a mistake i made i think when i first started working with you guys <laughs> was i dived into the different things that i saw and i'm like i want to do this i want to do this and i hadn't established those relationships and then you know it kind of goes into this second point that they have here which is bad faith like People didn't understand what I was doing and I was breaking things. And so I hadn't re established that relationship. And all they knew was Andy is breaking the things that I am doing during the day. So they didn't realize that I was trying to act in good faith to try to secure the company. And rightly so, because I, I was breaking their stuff. So yeah. I think I like that, you know, um, and just making sure that people know that you're, you got to be transparent in what you're doing can't hide it and you want to make sure that people know that you're acting in good faith oh yeah yeah again it, it's it's about the relationship it's all about friction with the end user right any other friction you're going to add whether it be typical end user developer everybody just wants to do their job and if you add something else that's going to add you know maybe an extra 10 even if it's a couple of seconds like let's take some security tools that might, you know, you run a scanner, you run a filter of some sort, it adds latency to whatever, they're, that's big, right? Maybe they're used to hitting a button, it processes and goes. You better have a good reason for, for doing that. And, you know, hey, we're protecting you. This is actually, you know, because this vulnerability over here and, you know, it's gonna protect moving forward. You'll have less downtime and you're not just uh, arbitrarily adding you know, more difficult you know, items to their to their standard work process. They just want to get their job done. The business just wants to, you know, move along with the business and they don't need, you know, unnecessary items put in place. 100%. So the third point that they have here is no reciprocity. And I know that I've encountered this in my career where Either I want something or an end user wants something and the answer is just no. There's no give and take. So I think this is a really good point in the fact that if you want to be successful as a team, sometimes you need to give a little bit. You might lose the battle, but hopefully, so to speak, you'll win the war, right? Oh, right, right, right. It's, yeah, exceptions, right? That's really what they're talking about there. It's like, okay, you're, you're going to do this to 98%, but 2% are going to be maybe exceptions. You have to have exceptions for just about everything. And it, again, it depends on your business, 
hundred percent, right? If you're in a you know restricted business and you have to deal with DFARS or you have to deal with um, different regulations, yeah, those are those aren't um, things that you can move on. You, you, there is no wiggle room there. But a lot of other items there are, um, and it, you know, working with the end users, working with the different business units, different groups, you work to build those in, or maybe. You know, and it's not necessarily that, hey, we have to give up or the InfoSec team has to give up on that gate or that tool, but maybe it's just a different way of doing it, right? Instead of having, let's say for MFA, um, people didn't want it on their phones because they can't bring phones into their industry. Well, okay, you get a, a FIDO2 token or you get a YubiKey or something like that, right? You're, you're still doing the MFA. You're just um, doing it in a different manner. Yeah, I like that. So the fourth point here is irrationality. And I think this is a big one, right? Like you you want to have a rational reason on why you're doing things. And they talk about having data and facts and sound logic. And I think sometimes we get defensive. Like somebody, we want to implement a policy and then someone's like, no, why would we want to do that? And, And we may think it's an obvious thing, but we get defensive about it and then that creates friction and then it goes nowhere. So I think this is a big one here. Yeah, uh, you bet. And I I think maybe recently in the last year and a half, it's become easier and easier for the InfoSec side to have, hey, here are the reasons. Just look at some of these big headlines. You can't use that only, but it definitely helps the conversation because the board reads that, the CIO reads that, you know, upper management does, so it's, it's, it's a little bit easier to push things through. But when you look at, uh, you know, something like MDM, MDM solutions can be a little a little tricky, right? You're, they tend to be a little heavy-handed, is what some people might think. Um, here again, it totally depends on your business. There's multiple ways to do this, and you don't have to have full MDM. But a lot of ones, you know, yeah, you need that. You need to have... Um, maybe the jailbroken protection, right? You don't. You want to make sure your users aren't using machines or devices that have incorrect software OSs, non-approved OSs, jailbroken, et cetera, right? So you might be at that level and you're going to have to really do your research and make sure, hey, pull, the, it depends, you know, maybe you have some certifications that your organization has to adhere to. You could pull that information from there and say, hey, this is why we're doing this. We're not... Yeah, we're not only doing it because it's it's better for the organization, but we're doing it due to these certifications that say, hey, we, we need to restrict jailbroken or non, non-approved non OSs, non-approved devices. Yeah, MDM is a good one because there are so many different settings that are almost like subjective, right? As security professionals, we look through those settings and we're like, yeah, that's pretty obvious, right? We're going to not allow corporate data to be transferred f- outside of a non-managed app or a managed app. And so, but then all of a sudden in practice, someone wants to copy a phone number from their email and, and paste it into the dialer, which is technically an unapproved app. And all of a sudden right. they can't. And then you're like, well, okay, you have to try to reevaluate, maybe find a way to just allow that particular thing or they want their contacts, right? Saved to their phone from their O365 account. Well, contacts is kind of a specific thing that links all O365 data together. So it's either let all or none. And right. so you have to try to find a, a way to satisfy that because in practice, it's a little different than in theory. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, MDM for sure, but all, all um, security policies, I think it's good to have some sort of data to point to before you before you implement so that you have a good argument when someone pushes back on you right it, it, it's no different than so you want to buy something and you need to go you know have a financial justification for it. it's the same same premise you can't you can't go out and spend ten thousand dollars for no reason it has to have a good business justification same thing with an infosec tool it has to have a good justification what's what's the value of adding that you know process, task, hardware, whatever, um, to the business. So uh, the final one 
is rigidity, which I think is a little bit of an overlap too on some of the yeah. things that we've talked about. But mm -hmm. what they're saying is, is that, you know, if a decision or agreement that was made becomes unrealistic or unreasonable later on, so not being flexible, so to speak, after a decision has been made. And, and I can definitely relate to that. Like you make a decision on a specific thing and then two years down the line, it doesn't make any sense anymore. Like you should be flexible to reevaluate the risk and the reason why that was put into place before, before, and then, uh, you know, maybe change it up based on relevant information now. Yeah, things change. You maybe you put in a new tool that makes the the previous policy or guard or whatever you had in place irrelevant, right? You you don't need it. You can open that up a little bit more and which hey that wins more capital with your end users and maybe IT base as well, right? And knowing that everything's not just set in stone, you will move. And, it, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, right? You might have conversations with a business partner on a tool or a project they're working on and you say, okay, well right now this is what needs to be done until X, Y, Z are put in place. Then we can come back, have another conversation and we can remove maybe some of those guardrails or you know, components that we put on there to make sure that you know the business is still safe, data is protected. Um, that's the biggest piece. I'm going to throw you just a quick curveball here. We're at the end of the list here, but I wanted to just give our listeners an idea because there are so many different areas of information security. And one of them being operations or incident response. And you know, that's what you kind of oversee now. So, and it's also what a lot of beginning aspiring information security professionals start with and so i just wanted to see you know a day in the life of a infosec operations manager you know what do you kind of do and you know what can like someone who works for you expect to get out of the business like is it just a starting position do you think it's something that you can actually become specialized in or you know is this just a, a starting point and going on to somewhere else yeah, it's definitely a good starting point, I believe, because you, you really you get your hands in the tools. That's what you need, right? You get your hands in the tools, learn the, the back end, the front end, the operations portion of it. You get to dive into maybe the alerts on the SIM side, on your EDR solutions, NDR solutions. Um, so it really, it really pulls out your curiosity, hopefully, which is what you have, right? I think you really, that's a base for any cybersecurity analyst or any IT person really, but hey, oh, what's this? And then knowing which way to go with it. From the and that's a lot what you do on the operations side, right? You're, you're dealing with tickets in any ticketing system for, it can be anything from, hey, a user's requesting access to this, or a new piece of software is coming in need to, that needs to be reviewed, or there's a new piece of software that was already reviewed, brought in, what safeguards can be put in place? Um, and it's, it's a lot of dealing with end users and other teams, especially other teams. It's, you know, you're going to deal with the network side, the sysadmin side, the cloud side, SRE side, all, you know, pretty much hit every aspect of IT from the operations manager side. It's really about, um, coordinating all of that, right? So you're, things get pushed up, they get escalated. You have to have escalation points, you know, they're tier three but maybe something gets escalated. Hey, Nate, you know, we have somebody that's going outside of policy and that happens all the time. And when you go outside of policy, you need that, that next level, maybe management or above to really, you know, work through those issues, talk with other leaders, other managers. And then also you're involved with, Hey, what's the vision for the team? Where do you, where do you see the company going? What, what items could you put in place that would bring value to the information security team? and the business, right? You need to think about that and then how are you going to sell it to the business, roll it out to the business in the most efficient manner with the least amount of pushback. It's all about building up. I, I hate to say this, but it's, it's almost like, um, you know, when you do a change order, you're, you're gonna go to all the um, stakeholders beforehand to get everybody's thoughts 
whatever to see what kind of resistance you might occur might incur that way you can prepare for it and maybe change your your whole role how you're going to do that your how you're moving forward that way when you do go to try and get your you know the buy-in from everyone it's it's a lot easier and it's not like oh we're just going to shove this out i i can say um we put a usb device block in place in our organization that can be very very contentious um usbs are still used uh, by a majority of organizations and that that took a lot of um of, of back work a lot of talking to the different stakeholders before actually even going through and really coming up with a full plan and initial rollout. Yeah. So when you actually put in the change ticket or you do the change, it's already socialized. It's, they're right. not getting blindsided by the change. Right? right. And they, and they had a seat at the table. They're like, Hey Nate, you know, great idea. Great idea. We, we understand the need for it, but here's maybe how it wouldn't be as impactful to the team or, you know, here's how you can help out. Yeah, and sometimes those are things that are brought up that teams didn't think about, InfoSec teams didn't think about when they were buying the product or thinking about implementing it. You don't see how it's going to impact, and maybe those stakeholders have a great idea of how it's going to make it less impactful. So it's always good to get that buy-in and socialize the idea. So, yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Andy. You know, we I, I have no idea how certain members of our organization utilize certain tools. I really don't. I try to, you know, I'll go in and try to get as much information as possible, but still it's hard. You know, that whole walk in someone else's shoe mantra, it's like, you know, have their experience. Okay. They can't do this due to, you know, do this or that. So 100%. Nate, I appreciate you coming on and kind of co-hosting the show with me. Thank you. Um, if our listeners have some questions about you know, operations, security operations, or, you know, just how you approach the business. Because I think, again, I learned a great deal from you and, and both Doug on the attitude on how to approach a business when it comes to rolling out tools and policies. So if, if our listeners do have some questions, they want to reach out to you, where's the best place that they can do that? Thank you, Andy. No, I, I appreciate the time on the podcast and I yeah, know it's been great. If listeners want to reach out, uh, they can hit me up on LinkedIn. Awesome. I will put that link in our show notes as well as the link to this article if you guys wanted to read it in full. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, my information as well as Adam's will be in the show notes if you guys want to reach out to us for questions on the show or topics that you guys want us to talk about. Thanks and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.